Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's my first time to present a, a SciArc conference. It's amazing. Thanks to Ben and Barbara. This is the next generation of visualization. And um, like Matthew said, uh, visualization and archaeology go hand in hand. Um, I myself, being at National Geographic, an archaeologist at National Geographic, I feel a little bit un-Victorian. I have come to realize that I dig the photographer photographs. <laughs> we don't migrate back and forth as much as, as they did 160 years ago. But it's this collaboration that I want to talk about uh, that I, I think is the future. And, and what I see at SciArc really is the future. Uh, as we say at National Geographic, collaboration is not an option. We have to work together. And uh, unlike many of the presenters here, we have not yet embarked on our collaboration with SciArc. But we see a great future between National Geographic and SciArc. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about National Geographic. Before I start, I'm going to give you three examples of ways that we could work together. Um, but before that, we do that, I do want to tell you a little bit about National Geographic. You know about the magazine. We have a channel, a television channel, that's um, produced in 40 different languages around the world. That leads to some 400 million viewers around the world. We're all about public access. We're all about democratization of information and about teaching. Um, but we're also a funder. We've given 11,000 research grants over our 100 years of giving. And uh, we like to work with people in the field. And we like to keep the experiences in the field. And so we've already seen a presentation about industry, about museums. I'd like to talk a little bit about the future in the field. But before we do that, we'll just juice it up here a little bit. With a sizzle reel from National Geographic. We take you to the edge of the undiscovered, driven by a quest for adventure, for the untold story, to explore the unknown. At National Geographic, we take you where you haven't gone before asking the hard questions and making an impact. Our yellow border reaches deep into the hearts and minds of millions, inspiring them to care about the planet. That's our responsibility, our mission, our passion. It compels us to climb to new heights, study the ocean's depths, work two years for the perfect image, walk seven years to retrace our human journey. Our passion powers us to tell meaningful stories in unforgettable ways, taking us and you to the farthest corners of our world and beyond. At National Geographic, we're more curious, more committed, and more connected to every person, place, photograph, and story. We are driven to move you like no one else can. National Geographic, we take you there. Wow, I can't do that. But I can imagine in the next time we do a sizzle like that, we're going to have some 3D laser scans of some amazing places around the world. And that's the dream. Um, we cross paths in many different ways at Geographic. I mean, for the last 125 years, we've really been about documenting cultures, nature, peoples around the world. Documenting cultural heritage is something that we're really good at, something that I'm involved in, something that we have researchers around the world, something that you guys are doing as well. That leads naturally to preserving cultural heritage. We have become very proactive about topics at National Geographic. We save the whales. We save the oceans. We need to put a spotlight on saving culture. And that's a place where we can interact. And the interaction not only is in documenting, preserving,
but definitely democratization. This public access is really the core of where the legacy lies on this. And I'm going to give three examples of ways that we could work on uh, three different areas of the world. And uh, I cross paths with Matthew's talk a little bit because I also love photography. And I um, want to tell you a little bit about the relationship of documenting cultural heritage and National Geographic because it has been one of the great places where we're doing that and it's one of the places where we will interact with SciArc and the, with the rest of our friends here. This is Machu Picchu in 1912. It was taken, this photograph was taken by Hiram Bingham. He was the director of an expedition that was searching along the Inca Trail. And I like to say that Hiram Bingham, who was a historian, not an archeologist, should be put on a pedestal of fame because he was a great documenter. In our archives at National Geographic, we've got 2,500 photographs from Hiram Bingham documenting the original state of Machu Picchu. I think this archive is incredible. Machu Picchu today is the top tourist destination in Peru. To compare these pictures that we have from its original discovery with the contemporary um, uh, structure, I think is a great potential for the future and it's something that I want to do. Um, and this focus on photography and documentation at National Geographic continued well beyond Hiram Bingham in those early days. Uh, here's our very first color photograph of an excavation in National Geographic. First time we've seen dirt tossed <laughs> in a color photograph. This is 1946. Um, this is Strong and Evans discovery of a, the first intact Moche tomb on the coast of Peru ever. And uh, it's interesting that, that they went to the efforts of most of the photographs in, in 1946 were in black and white, but they went to the effort of putting in a color photo of tossing dirt. It, we don't even have color photos of tossing dirt in the magazine today. We continued that innovation in photography and archaeology um, into the 80s, more discoveries of intact royal tombs from Peru, um, and you actually get to sort of walk into the sites. And this documentation and the public access through now millions of people who are reading National Geographic is really the strength of, of what we can do, and it provides preservation for these sites. Many of these sites, once they're excavated, disappear almost instantly because unlike you know, industrial archaeology or the artifacts in the British Museum, these moments in archaeology are fleeting. They last just a little bit of time. Even the work that I do in my own excavations where I'm excavating mud brick adobe walls, such as this in, in um, the, the Huaca de la Luna in Peru, uh, adobe walls beautifully painted, uh, very, very at risk. Once they're cleaned, these have only been cleaned um, for and, and only been exposed for the last 10 years. Uh, these need to be documented right here. One of our scholars, Fabio Amador, is doing a gigapan image of these. But these would be perfect candidates for SciArc's laser scanning to preserve an archive for the future. We at Geographic also use photography for preservation, and here's an innovation that we've been working with the Peruvians on, taking quadcopters and doing site monitoring to keep the incidents of looting uh, at bay, to be able to identify sites immediately um, through quadcopters, satellite photography. We're able to use documentation to help stop the destruction of cultural heritage around the world, and I think that that's very important as we move into the 21st century, as we see conflict zones in many, many parts of the world uh, that have great antiquity, great history, that people can't go visit, where the sites are potentially at great risk. My second example is what got me into this field of cultural heritage. I was sort of your regular Joe professor at University of Pennsylvania in 2000. 2003, when I first had a chance to go to Afghanistan to go investigate the museum. This is the museum when I got there. 
Its roof had been blown off. There are no windows. There are no artifacts inside. In fact, littered on the ground of the museum were the inventory cards. It was pretty sad to go there. However, we did have a chance to meet with the museum director who said, ah, but you know, even in conflict zones, people take care of their cultural heritage, and they had hid the artifacts away. So we embarked on a process of working with the Afghans to open the hidden boxes, and it really was an amazing collaboration. In the field, we had to develop a way to document artifacts in non-museum environments in garages, in bank vaults. Uh, I've had a chance to, to do this process in Heathrow Airport in a burned out uh, hangar. It's really quite amazing. It's called the Mobile Inventory Lab. Portable inventory lab, digital, uh, that allows objects to be very quickly inventoried and documented. And this kind of documentation, which provides a passport for objects, is the documentation that will prevent these objects from getting stolen. It's really, really important. We had the full support of the Afghan government in this. Uh, it was quite amazing. When, when the vaults were opened, when the boxes were opened, it, it was a sensation, not only on the pages of National Geographic, but on the streets in Afghanistan itself, as people came to realize in Afghanistan that after 22 years of war, they themselves had saved their own cultural heritage. Um, and this is just an example of the type of artifacts that came out of those boxes. We created an exhibition that toured as an ambassador for Afghanistan, continues to tour to this day, seven years of being an ambassador. That's what cultural heritage can do for a culture. We take that to another level. We actually are training here in Washington, DC, US Customs agents to identify antiquities. These are people who don't know about museums, about inventory, how to document, but we can train them. Uh, we trained 13 US Customs agents this January at, at Dulles Airport to do, use the mobile inventory uh, to go around and document these artifacts at a museum quality level, uh, even in a hangar at, at Dulles Airport, and we're returning 1,500 stolen objects to Afghanistan this year. Uh, we use our data from these inventories. We also use site data to help prevent uh, destruction. We create um, avoidance zones that we hand off to military. This is happening in Syria. It's happening in Libya. It's happening in Egypt. It's something that the cultural heritage community does to help prevent looting and site destruction around the world. And we are now, archaeologists and cultural heritage and museum people, are proactive in this field. Let's turn to our last example, and this is really where I see great potential of work with SIAC, Egypt. Egypt is a country with thousands of standing monuments that have been known since the time of Napoleon. The sites those themselves line the Nile Valley, the exact same footprint where modern people are living today. It's a very restricted area, people living right on top of the archaeological sites, very challenging. Here's one of the sites that we focused on to create a, a best practices model in uh, Egypt. This is Tel Timai. It's a site, a Ptolemaic site from the time of Cleopatra. It's, it's actually the site where Cleopatra had created her fabulous perfumes that she used to intrigue men, I suppose you could say. <laughs> anyway, this site is wonderful. It, it, it's uh, adobe. It's mud brick. It's at risk environmentally, it's at risk for what we call site encroachment. There in the upper left-hand side, you see the modern town, which is growing, growing population. The archaeological site is right next to it. So some of the things that we're doing, we're trying to take cultural heritage and, and take the traditions of National Geographic of documenting to the next point with conservation. Um, we're, doing, we're sponsoring salvage archaeology along the, the edge of the sites. We're using drones. We're also creating visual documentation on the ground of what's the site and what's not. What are these? These are modern mud, mud bricks that we're using to create a, a site perimeter wall around the site. Now, 
They're just made out of mud brick. You can easily jump over them, but it's so visually clear to see the difference between the site and the town that we hope that this is going to make a big difference in the protection of that site. Tel Timai is also a site where we at National Geographic help sponsor a public awareness document. It's a comic book, it's a graphic novel, sorry, that's the technical term, um, for the kids, which are distributed. This booklet is just being produced now. It's being produced for distribution in the town to give to the kids in Tel Timai to tell them about cultural heritage, why it's important to preserve sites, why it's important to maintain that sense of pride about culture in their own area and tell them about the history underneath their feet. We use satellite images to document the incidents of looting and this December we're going to do a, a training workshop in Egypt to bring all these techniques not only to Tel Tzimai but to a greater array of sites and individuals in Egypt. And it's at this point that I would really love to engage SciArc. We would love to include the 3D digital documentations of sites that are at tremendous risk, such as the Step Pyramid at Saqqara. It has many problems in preservation. Its sides are starting to crumble. This is a high, high priority site that I hope that we can leave this conference as partners working in Egypt, working in other cultures around the world, and helping not only to document, but to provide the public access and the democratization of this information, which will help preserve these sites, not only for our generation, but for the next. Thank you very much.